The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 13 Erasmus and Luther in Debate Nearly any in-depth discussion with Calvinists eventually touches on the issue of free will, and, nearly always, reference will be made to Martin Luther's bondage of the will. John Armstrong declares, This is what the Reformation is ultimately all about, the bondage of the will. Luther said that this is the most important book, because it takes us back where the real battle is. Calvinists are not alone in their high regard for this lengthy treatise. Many evangelicals, even without having read Bondage, hold it and Luther in high regard, simply because of the key role he played in the Reformation. Yes, the entire world owes Martin Luther a depth of gratitude for his stalwart stand against the tyranny of Roman Catholicism, which ruled the world without challenge at that time. That does not mean, however, that we ought to accept everything that came from his pen without comparing it carefully to God's word. Appalled by the licentiousness he had seen in the Vatican and among the clergy in his visit to Rome, and by the sale of indulgences as tickets to heaven— financing the ongoing construction and remodeling of St. Peter's Basilica, on October 31, 1517, Luther nailed his Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, known as the Ninety-Five Theses, to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Chapel. John Calvin was then eight years old. Copies translated from the original Latin were widely distributed in many languages, inciting heated debate all across Europe, and arousing hope among multitudes that the yoke of Rome could at last be loosened, if not broken. When one studies his ninety-five theses, however, it seems that Luther was not entirely opposed to indulgences, only to their abuses. At this point he was still a Roman Catholic in his heart, not desiring to leave that false and corrupt church but rather to reform it. Instead of leaving, he would be excommunicated. He rejected the sale of indulgences for money and the false proclamation that an indulgence of any kind could purchase salvation. That he did, however, still believe in purgatory and accepted the value of indulgences of a limited kind is quite clear from the following excerpts of his Ninety-Five Theses. Paragraph 17 to 22. Furthermore, it does not seem proved, either by reason or by scripture, that souls in purgatory are outside the state of merit. Nor does it seem proved that souls in purgatory, at least not all of them, are certain and assured of their own salvation. Indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. As a matter of fact, the Pope remits to souls in purgatory no penalty which, according to canon law, they should have paid in this life. Paragraph 26. The Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory, not by the power of the keys, which he does not have, but by way of intercession for them. Paragraph 29. Who knows whether all souls in purgatory wish to be redeemed, since we have exceptions in St. Severinus and St. Pascal, as related in a legend. Paragraphs 38 to 41. Nevertheless, papal remission and blessing are by no means to be disregarded, but must be preached with caution lest people erroneously think that they are preferable to other good works of love. It is quite clear that Luther, far from having renounced all of Rome's abominations, was only cautiously groping his way. The same would be true of Calvin, who followed Luther's footsteps some years later. Nor were either of these reformers ever delivered completely from Rome's errors. Tragically, 
Much unbiblical baggage was thereby carried over from Catholicism into Lutheranism and Calvinism, which remains to this day. For example, millions of Lutherans and Calvinists around the world remain under the deadly delusion that their baptism as infants made them children of God fit for heaven. Their subsequent confirmation only reinforces that deadly delusion. A few relevant facts. On October the 12th, 1518, Luther was summoned to Rome by order of Pope Leo X. Arrested, he was held at Augsburg for trial before Cardinal Cajetan. Refused an impartial tribunal, Luther fled for his life by night. On January 3rd, 1521, a formal bull was issued by the Pope consigning Luther to hell if he did not recant. The Emperor, pledging Luther's safety, summoned him to appear before the Imperial Diet in Worms on April 17, 1521. The Chancellor of Treves, orator of the Diet, demanded that he retract his writings. Luther made this fearless and famous reply. I cannot submit my faith, either to the Pope or to the councils, because it is clear as day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture, or by the clearest reasoning, I cannot and I will not retract. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Now an outlaw by papal edict, Luther fled again and was kidnapped on his way back to Wittenberg by friends who took him for safekeeping to Wartburg Castle. From there he disseminated more heresy in writings that further shook all Europe. Rome's determination to eliminate Lutheran infidelity, as expressed by the Catholic authorities in March 1529, at the Second Diet of Speyer, provoked a number of independent princes to assert the right to live according to the Bible. They expressed this firm resolve in the famous protest of April 19, 1529, from which the term Protestant was coined. The Imperial Diet was convened in Augsburg for a thorough examination of Protestant heresies. Luther, having been excommunicated in 1521, was a wanted man and dared not appear. On June 25, 1530, the Augsburg Confession, prepared by Melanchthon in consultation with Luther, was read before about 200 dignitaries. It delineated the clear differences between Lutheranism and Catholicism. In particular, Article 4 affirmed that men are freely justified, their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, who, by his death, has made satisfaction for our sins. Article 13 declared that the sacraments were ordained to be signs and testimonies, and condemned those who teach that the sacraments justify by the outward act. Article 15 admonished that human traditions instituted to propitiate God, to merit grace, and to make satisfaction for sins, are opposed to the gospel and the doctrine of faith. Wherefore, vows and traditions concerning meats and days and so on, instituted to merit grace and to make satisfaction for sins, are useless and contrary to the gospel." Luther still hoped that the Church could be reformed from within. Thus the Augsburg Confession still viewed the Roman Catholic Church as the true Church, and those signing it claimed to be true Catholics. Several times that document refers to the steadfastness of the preparers' traditional Catholic faith, particularly in their stand for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, still accepted by Lutherans today, and for the regenerative power of infant baptism in opposition to the heretical Anabaptists. Amazingly, that rather Catholic document has been the creed of most Lutherans ever since, 
officially incorporating some of Rome's errors into modern-day Lutheranism. Thus, it is not surprising that in Augsburg, on October 31st, 1999, the date and place could hardly be a coincidence, and what can only be construed as a slap at Martin Luther and the Reformation, the Lutheran World Federation and representatives of the Roman Catholic Church signed a joint declaration on justification by faith, claiming agreement on the major point that had divided Lutherans and Catholics for nearly 470 years. Contradictions, contradictions. While this agreement was being reached to heal a theological schism which had begun over indulgences, Pope John Paul II was defiantly offering special indulgences for the year 2000. Forgiveness of sins for giving up cigarettes for a day, for making a pilgrimage to Rome, for walking through one or more of the four holy doors he would open, and so forth. In spite of this new agreement between Lutherans and Catholics, not one change could be noted in Roman Catholic beliefs and practices. Everything that Martin Luther had so vigorously opposed was still fully in place, including the wearing of scapulars, promising that whosoever dies wearing this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. John Paul II, who many evangelicals call a fine Christian, has worn one since childhood. The wearing of supposedly miraculous medals for protection, the use of holy water, prayers to saints, and especially to Mary for help and even salvation, pilgrimages to shrines, some pilgrims walking on bloodied knees, the better to earn forgiveness for their sins, and too many other unbiblical and superstitious practices to enumerate. Never had the justification by faith which Luther preached been so thoroughly denied, and that by Lutherans eager to heal the essential breach with Rome for which thousands were burned at the stake. The Pope even had the impertinence to remind the world that the practice of holy pilgrimages for forgiveness of sins had been initiated in 1300 by Pope Boniface VIII, whom he lauded as of blessed memory. Apparently, John Paul II thought it had been forgotten that Boniface was a murderous anti-Christian, openly fornicating pope. A mother and her daughter were both among his mistresses. He had been so evil, though hardly more evil than many of both his predecessor and successor popes, that Dante's Inferno had him buried upside down in the deepest crevasse of hell. Slaying its six thousand inhabitants, Boniface, of blessed memory to John Paul II, had utterly destroyed the beautiful Colonna city of Palestrina, Italy, with all its art and historic structures dating back to Julius Caesar, reducing it to a ploughed field that he sowed with salt, giving indulgences to those who did this wanton evil. Boniface had issued Unum Sanctam, an infallible papal bull, in 1302, which is still in force and effect today, declaring that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church, and that for anyone to be saved, it was altogether necessary to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Less than a year after the joint declaration, John Paul II, not to be outdone by Boniface, confirmed again that there was no salvation outside his church. Lutherans were offended, as though this were something new. Yet the Pope has made such pronouncements before, and the same dogma has long been stated in Catholic catechisms and numerous other official documents. Nor had the new agreement between Lutherans and Catholics even addressed, much less corrected, numerous other Romish heresies. Credit where credit is due. Unquestionably, Martin Luther was a great reformer to whom we owe, by God's grace, much of the freedom of worship, conscience, and speech that exists throughout the Western world today, in contrast, for example, 
to the almost total absence of such blessings in the Muslim and communist worlds. However, much took place prior to Luther that made possible what he accomplished. That fact must be taken into account in evaluating his contributions. Luther himself said, We are not the first to declare the papacy to be the kingdom of Antichrist, since for many years before us, so many and so great men have undertaken to express the same thing so clearly. For example, in a full council at Reims in the 10th century, the Bishop of Orléans called the Pope the Antichrist. In the 11th century, Rome was denounced as the See of Satan by Berenger of Tours. The Waldensians identified the Pope as Antichrist in an A.D. 1100 treatise entitled The Noble Lesson. In 1206, an Albigensian conference in Montreal, France, indicated the Vatican as the woman drunk with the blood of the martyrs, which he has continued to prove to this day in spite of shameful new agreements, such as evangelicals and Catholics together, and the more recent Joint Declaration. A movement among priests and monks calling for a return to the Bible began many centuries before Luther. The Reformation movement within the Roman Church can be traced as far back as Priscillian, Bishop of Avila, falsely accused of heresy, witchcraft, and immorality by a synod in Bordeaux, France, in A.D. 384, Seven of his writings proving these charges false were recently discovered in Germany's University of Würzburg Library. Priscillian and six others were beheaded at Trier in 385 AD. Millions of true Christians were martyred at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church in the succeeding centuries prior to the Reformation. Jumping ahead to the late 1300s, John Wycliffe, called the Morning Star of the Reformation, championed the authority of the Scriptures, translated and published them in English, while almost as fast Roman Catholics burned them, and preached and wrote against the evils of the popes and Catholic dogmas, especially transubstantiation. Influenced by Wycliffe, Jan Hus, a fervent Catholic priest and rector of Prague University, was excommunicated in 1410. He was burned as a heretic in 1415, 100 years before Luther and the Protestant Reformation, for calling a corrupt church to holiness and the authority of God's word. In 1429, Pope Martin V commanded the King of Poland to exterminate the Hussites. Many others who lived even closer to Luther's time played an important part in preparing Europe for the Reformation. One of these was Erasmus of Rotterdam. Because of his role in provoking Luther to write what some have called his masterpiece, The Bondage of the Will, this fascinating man, called by some historians the bridge to the Reformation, must occupy some of our attention. At the height of the Reformation, it was popularly said in Paris that Luther had only opened the door after Erasmus had picked the lock. Erasmus of Rotterdam Erasmus is one of the most interesting and enigmatic and in many ways tragic figures in history. He was born out of wedlock, a fact unknown to his father, Gerard, who, having fled in guilt from Holland to Rome, was told that his lover Margaret had died. Consumed with grief and remorse, Gerard entered the priesthood. Upon later returning to Holland, he discovered, to his great joy, that Margaret was alive, as was the son she had borne. Gerard, however, would not break his sacerdotal vows, nor would Margaret marry any other. Together they devoted themselves to their child Erasmus, whom they put into school at the early age of four. Despite being orphaned in his teens and living for years in desperate poverty, Erasmus pursued the study of Greek, Latin, and the classics, and became possibly the most eloquent scholar of his day. 
ordained an Augustinian priest at the age of twenty-four. The year Columbus sailed to America, his splendid intellect and unusual clarity of expression eventually made Erasmus famous. He was courted by the powerful and rich, including kings, princes, prelates, and even popes, who carried his favor. Henry VIII invited Erasmus to England, where he lectured at Cambridge University, and was a friend of luminaries such as Archbishop Warham, John Collett, and Sir Thomas More. All the while, Erasmus made no secret of his dislike of many of his church's practices. Both Erasmus's rejection of Rome's central doctrine of transubstantiation and his sense of humor, and no less his ability to remain in the good graces of important people in spite of offending them, are illustrated by a famous incident. Sir Thomas had loaned Erasmus a horse to carry him to the ship that would take him back across the channel to the continent. The ever irascible Erasmus took the horse with him aboard ship, and reaching shore, rode it all the way home. When Moore complained, Erasmus wrote back, reflecting that many times Moore had attempted to convince him of transubstantiation, a brief jingle as follows. You said of the bodily presence of Christ, Believe that you have, and you have him. Of the nag that I took, my reply is the same, Believe that you have, and you have him. Erasmus the renegade had already channeled his keen wit into the most cutting satire, which he used to unveil and combat the vices of the Roman Catholic Church. He attacked the monks and the prevailing abuses with elegant and biting sarcasms against the theology and devotion of his age. He immolated those schoolmen and those ignorant monks against whom he had declared war. As one of his devices, Erasmus cleverly used fiction as a weapon. In The Praise of Folly, written largely at Moore's home, he personified the goddess Folly as Moriah, to whom he gave such lines as, Do we not see every country claiming its peculiar saint? Each trouble has its saint, and every saint his candle. This cures the toothache that assists women in childbed. A third restores what a thief has stolen. Especially virtuous is the Virgin Mother of God, in whom the people place more confidence than in her son. Moriah attacks the bishops, who run more after gold than after souls. Even the highest officials in Rome cannot escape. She asks, Can there be any greater enemies to the church than these unholy pontiffs, who allow Jesus Christ to be forgotten, who bind him by their mercenary regulations, who falsify his doctrine by forced interpretations, and crucify him a second time by their scandalous lives. The Forerunner of the Reformation The Praise of Folly appeared in twenty-seven editions and in every European language during the lifetime of Erasmus, and contributed more than any other writing to confirm the anti-sacerdotal tendency of the age. He urged men to get back to the Christianity of the Bible, and pointed out that the Vulgate swarmed with errors. One year before Luther nailed his ninety-five theses to the Wittenberg chapel door, Erasmus published his own critical edition of the New Testament in Greek, which contributed immensely to Luther's later success by opening a clearer picture of God's truth to many serious students of Scripture. Erasmus raised his voice against the mass of church regulations about dress, fasting, feast days, vows, marriage, and confessions, which oppressed the people and enriched the priests. Eloquently he pressed his attack, of which the following is representative. In the churches, they scarcely ever think of the gospel. The greater part of their sermons must be drawn up to please the commissaries of indulgences. The most holy doctrine of Christ must be suppressed or perverted to their profit. There is no longer any hope of cure, 
unless Christ himself should turn the hearts of rulers and of pontiffs and excite them to seek for real piety. From today's perspective, it is almost impossible to appreciate the courage it took for Erasmus and a few others of influence to make such public declarations. There are so many unsung heroes of the Reformation, and it is a pity that we cannot give them all due credit. Perhaps the meekest and least appreciated, Oiko Lampadius, who had declared himself in favor of Luther at Augsburg in late 1518. Later, when Oiko Lampadius took refuge in Basel, crowds filled St. Martin's Church whenever he took the pulpit. Erasmus fled to Basel also, and the two fugitives became friends. Fearing that Erasmus' friendship with Oiko Lampadius would soften the latter's stand against Rome, Luther wrote to warn him with these guarded words, I fear much that Erasmus, like Moses, will die in the country of Moab, and never lead us into the land of promise. In spite of their serious differences, however, the friends of Luther, and even the reformer himself, had long hoped to see Erasmus unite with them against Rome. Unfortunately, in his heart, Erasmus, like some of the equally tragic Jewish religious leaders in Christ's day, and some evangelical leaders in our own, was willing to displease God in order to gain praise from men. In the growing controversy, he attempted to remain in the good graces of the church hierarchy while endeavoring to obtain concessions from Rome that would unite the extreme parties. The vacillations and inconsistency of Erasmus disgusted Luther. "'You desire to walk upon eggs without crushing them,' complained Rome's fearless and uncompromising enemy. Finally, the open antagonism. As the breach grew between him and Luther, Erasmus was applied to from all quarters. The Pope, the Emperor, kings, princes, scholars, and even his most intimate friends entreated him to write against the Reformer. No work, wrote the Pope, can be more acceptable to God and worthier of yourself and of your genius. In spite of his own opposition to Rome's corruptions that he had so often and eloquently expressed, he had remained in good standing with the Church. She had the power to provide him with great honors. Erasmus could not bring himself to make the sacrifice of coming out fully on the side of what he felt was Luther's extremism. Yet he preferred not to oppose Luther. It is a very easy thing to say, write against Luther, replied he to a Romish theologian, but it is a matter full of peril. This indecision on the part of Erasmus drew on him the attacks of the most violent men of both parties. Luther himself knew not how to reconcile the respect he felt for Erasmus's learning with the indignation he felt at his timidity. Finally, desiring to free himself from any lingering hope of gaining Erasmus's half-hearted help, Luther wrote to Erasmus in April 1524. The letter revealed both his impatience and continued respect for the man seventeen years his elder, and seemingly offered an olive branch so uncharacteristic of Luther. In part, he said, you have not yet received from the Lord the courage necessary to walk with us against the papists. We put up with your weakness, but do not pass over to our camp. Since you are wanting in courage, remain where you are. I could wish that our people would allow your old age to fall asleep peacefully in the Lord. The greatness of our cause has long since gone beyond your strength. But on the other hand, my dear Erasmus, refrain from scattering over us with such profusion that pungent salt which you know so well how to conceal under the flowers of rhetoric. For it is more dangerous to be slightly wounded by Erasmus than to be ground to powder by all the papists put together. Be satisfied to remain a spectator of our tragedy, 
and publish no books against me, and, for my part, I will write none against you. Luther must have known the reaction that such patronizing words would arouse from Erasmus. The master rhetorician was a proud man who took Luther's condescension as an insult to his genius and integrity. Now the die was cast. Dorbigny comments, Thus did Luther, the man of strife, ask for peace. It was Erasmus, the man of peace, who began the conflict. If he had not yet determined to write against Luther, he probably did so then. He had other motives besides. Henry VIII and other nobility earnestly pressed him to declare himself openly against the Reformation. Erasmus suffered the promise to be wrung from him. He was fond of glory, and already men were accusing him of fearing Luther, and of being too weak to answer him. He was accustomed to the highest seat, and the little monk of Wittenberg had dethroned the mighty philosopher of Rotterdam. All Christendom that adhered to the old worship implored him. A capacious genius and the greatest reputation of the age were wanted to oppose the Reformation. Erasmus answered the call. Erasmus had once rejoiced in Luther's fulminations against Rome. While cautioning the reformer to be more moderate and prudent, he had defended Luther with these words. God has given men a physician who cuts deep into the flesh, because the malady would otherwise be incurable. On another occasion he had told the elector of Saxony, I am not at all surprised that it, Luther's criticism, has made so much noise. For he has committed two unpardonable crimes. He has attacked the Pope's tiara and the monk's bellies. Erasmus's greatest weakness was the love of praise from those in high authority, and he cherished telling friends of the latest flatteries sent his way. Coming out openly against Luther would bring more praise than remaining on the sidelines. The Pope, wrote he with childish vanity to a friend, when he declared himself the opponent of Luther, has sent me a diploma full of kindness and honorable testimonials. His secretary declares that this is an unprecedented honor, and that the Pope dictated every word himself. In the final analysis, vanity had won out over truth. The epitaph that Scripture has written over the life of Erasmus applies equally to the evangelical leaders and churches who in our day are making similar compromises with Rome and even with Islam. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. John chapter 12, verse 43. May God deliver us from such leadership and grant repentance and a return to biblical truth. A Hopeless Strategy Erasmus could not, in good conscience, defend Rome's heresies and abuses. Neither could he call for the strong measures Luther was pressing, though he had once commended them. What should he do? What tack should he take? He chose to attack Luther, not on his opposition to Rome, which he could not honestly do, but on what Erasmus thought was an obscure point. In the autumn of 1524, Erasmus published his now famous Dissertation on the Freedom of the Will, known thereafter to Luther and his supporters as the Diatribe. He wrote to Henry VIII, Trust me, this is a daring act. I expect to be stoned for it. Yet what did that really matter when those with the most power and greatest rewards were fully on his side? The works of Erasmus had long before been listed on Pope Paul IV's Index of Prohibited Books, along with those of Calvin, Luther, and Zwingli. Now he received nothing but praise from every corner of the church. Luther's first reaction was anger that Erasmus would consider insignificant an issue of such great importance 
as whether man's will was free to act in response to the gospel. Nevertheless, at first he disdained to reply to a polemic that he considered so weak as to be unworthy of the battle. His silence brought exclamations of triumph from Rome's clergy. Well, where is your Luther now? Aha! He has met with his match at last. He has learnt now to remain in the background. He has found out how to hold his tongue. Luther's Provoked Response With uncharacteristic reluctance, Luther finally forced himself to prepare an answer which he began to work on toward the end of 1525, ten years before Calvin would write his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Melanchthon wrote to assure Erasmus that Luther's reply would be moderate, which Erasmus knew was an impossibility. Perhaps God had to choose men with defiant and even proud personalities to stand up to the pressure that Rome brought to bear upon those who dared to oppose her vaunted authority, a pitiless authority that had remained almost unchallenged for more than a thousand years. The language in Calvin's Institutes reveals a man the equal of Rome in his utter contempt of, and lack of patience or sympathy for those whose opinions diverged from his. Luther's writings reveal much the same, and he was brutal in his sarcastic put-down of Erasmus. The following is just a small sample of his ad hominem reply. By so doing, you merely let us see that in your heart you cherish a Lucian, or some other hog of Epicurus's herd. Surely at this point you are either playing tricks with someone else's words, or practicing a literary effect. You ooze Lucian from every pore. You swill Epicurus by the gallon. Here again, as usual, you muddle everything up, and so you fall once more to insulting and dishonoring Scripture and God. Let them blather who will. The truth is, you fetch from afar and rake together all these irrelevancies simply because you are embarrassed. Since you cannot overthrow foreknowledge by any argument, you try meantime to tire out the reader with a flow of empty verbiage. See, I pray you, what abundance of byways and bolt holes a slippery mind will seek out in its flight from truth. Yet it does not escape. I'll be hanged if the diatribe itself knows what it is talking about. Perhaps we have here the rhetorical trick of obscuring your meaning when danger is at hand, lest you be trapped in your words. Luther had not thought this subject through as thoroughly as he was forced now to do. He was willing to concede that man could indeed exercise his will in making choices with regard to earthly matters. But when it came to the question of man exercising any freedom of will towards his salvation, Luther laid the ground for what Calvin, who was about fifteen years old at this time, would ten years later present in his institutes after his conversion to Luther's Protestantism. In his much-admired The Bondage of the Will, Luther pompously chides and browbeats Erasmus. In this book of mine, I shall harry you and all the sophists till you tell me exactly what free will can and does do. And I hope to harry you, Christ helping me, as to make you repent of ever publishing your diatribe. God foreknows nothing contingently, that is, no events depend on something other than his will. He foresees, purposes, and does all things according to his own immutable, eternal, and infallible will. This bombshell knocks free will flat, and utterly shatters it. You insist that we should learn the immutability of God's will, while forbidding us to know the immutability of his foreknowledge. Do you suppose that he does not will what he foreknows, or that he does not foreknow what he wills? If he wills what he foreknows, his will is eternal and changeless, because his nature is so. 
from which it follows by resistless logic that all we do, however it may appear to us to be done mutably and contingently, is in reality done necessarily and immutably in respect to God's will. Here, as often elsewhere in bondage, Luther boasts of his conclusion without giving any valid supporting arguments. He secures his thesis by his own mere definition, not by logic or scripture. His assertions above do not follow, nor does he provide sufficient biblical support in this entire work to make his case for the will being in bondage. In bondage to what or to whom? He often implies the answer, but fails to develop it fully or to face the consequences. Luther is arguing that God's sovereignty, ipso facto, eliminates any possibility that man could exercise a free will. This bombshell knocks free will flat and utterly shatters it, he writes. That God foreknows the future, Luther argues, means that the future is already predetermined, and that in itself proves that man could not act freely. Augustine considers the same problem far more carefully than Luther, and comes to the opposite conclusion. We've already shown why Luther's idea is false. That God knows something will happen does not cause it to happen. It is true that, because God knows what Mr. Jones will decide and do in the future, the latter will surely do so, or God could be wrong, which is impossible. But that does not mean Mr. Jones cannot exercise a genuine choice in thought, word, and deed. God simply knows in advance what Mr. Jones's free choice will be. Is the will in bondage because God is sovereign, and he has already determined all that will occur? Luther seems to argue as much. Ten years later, Calvin would come to the same conclusion, no doubt influenced by Luther, though he would word his thesis somewhat differently and avoid giving Luther any credit. If God's sovereignty and foreknowledge eliminated man's free will, however, we would face a far worse dilemma. Man's will would be in bondage to God's will, making God the effective cause of every evil thought, word, and deed. The current dark state of our world would be exactly as God wills, rendering meaningless what Christ told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In vain, Luther tried to escape the obvious, uncomfortable quandary that if man cannot do anything except as God wills it, then God is the author of evil. That unhappy conclusion is forced upon us by an extreme view of sovereignty, which we have already seen is contradicted both by scripture and reason. There is no way to assert that man can only do what God wills without admitting that God is therefore the invisible hand, affecting all the evil that man commits. That assertion is blasphemy, yet it lies at the very foundation of Calvinism as well as Lutheranism. Is the will really in bondage? The defense of Calvinism traps even the best minds into hopeless contradictions. Spurgeon himself couldn't seem to make up his mind. In spite of referring to the equally sure doctrine that the will of man has its proper position in the work of salvation and is not to be ignored. Spurgeon also claimed that the idea of free will left the whole economy of grace and mercy to be the gathering together of fortuitous atoms impelled by man's own will. That obviously is not true. Fortuitous atoms have nothing to do with grace and mercy, nor does anyone who believes in man's power to make moral choices imagine that he can control atoms with his will. Spurgeon should have stayed with biblical exegesis. He went on to lament, We cannot tell on that theory whether God will be glorified or sin will triumph. Hardly, 
That we finite beings wouldn't know how something would turn out means nothing. The outcome always was known to God from eternity past. Sadly, great preacher that he was, in that sermon Spurgeon erected and destroyed one straw man after another. It must either be as God wills or as man wills. If not God, then you put man there to say, I will, or I will not. If I will it, I will enter heaven. If I will it, I will conquer the Holy Spirit. For I am stronger than God, and stronger than omnipotence. If I will it, I will make the blood of Christ of no effect. It shall be my purpose that shall make his purpose stand, or make it fall. With all respect to Spurgeon, this is nonsense. Even the rankest Armenian would never imagine that he could conquer the Holy Spirit, or that he was stronger than God, or that man's will would ever make the blood of Christ of no effect, or force an entrance into heaven. God has set the rules for entering heaven. Man either accepts or rejects the salvation God offers in Christ, but he is certainly not in charge. Like so many other Calvinists in their zeal to defend God's sovereignty to the exclusion of human will, Spurgeon stooped to twisting Scripture to his own ends. For example, he quotes Christ's indictment of the rabbis, You will not come to me that you might have life. He then declares, Where is free will after such a text as that? When Christ affirms that they will not, who dares say they will? Man is so depraved, so set on mischief, the way of salvation is so obnoxious to his pride, so hateful to his lusts, that he cannot like it, and will not like it, unless he who ordained the plan shall change his nature and subdue his will. Spurgeon misses the Lord's point. Christ is making this statement specifically to the rabbis, not to all men. Secondly, the statement itself says that they have a will, that by their own will they are rejecting him. You will not come to me, nor does Christ say that they cannot will to do otherwise. Indeed, Christ's statement would be meaningless unless they could of their own will repent and come to him. Only two chapters later, Christ declares, If any man will do his, that is, God's will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. John chapter 7 verse 17 Spurgeon himself in the same sermon quotes this scripture as proof that man's will has a part to play in man's coming to Christ. Is the will really in bondage? If so, to what or to whom? And is it possible to set the captive will free from its bondage? If so, how can this be done? We must consider those questions carefully, and we will do so in the context of a further examination of Luther's treatise.